Welcome to an episode of the award-winning podcast Art Insiders New York. My name is Anders Holst. The theme of the podcast is New York with a focus on behind-the-scenes conversations with fascinating people who are making an impact in the world of art, design, and architecture. Justin Rivers, the multi-talented Chief Experience Officer at Untapped New York, takes us on a fascinating tour of the city, unearthing the history of the old Penn Station and the new Daniel Moynihan train hall, considered to be one of the city's most ambitious modern civic projects. We will also visit the little-known underground subway landmark, the City Hall Loop, and the Chamber Street Station inside the David N. Dinkins Manhattan Municipal Building. Justin Rivers is a writer, playwright, educator, and a tour guide, whose most popular tours include the underground tour of the New York City subway, the remnants of Dutch New Amsterdam, and the remnants of Penn Station. Untapped New York, founded by Michelle Young in 2009, is visited by over 4 million people a year and has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, on Netflix, and more. Today, we are at Penn Station. So why are we here? What is your fascination? That's, that's what a lot of people ask. Why, Justin, do you spend so much time in what is uh, considered to be, by most Americans, one of the worst transportation hubs in the country? Yeah. Um, the reason why is because of the dichotomy of it once being the most beautiful transportation hub yeah. in America until 1963 when it was demolished by the Pennsylvania Railroad to make way for Madison Square Garden above our heads. But my fascination, even more so, beyond just the old beautiful Beaux-Arts structure that used to be here is actually the remnants of that old station still alive and well in the current station yeah. where we are today. You told me an interesting story. We met on 7th Avenue and then we walked into an entrance and you said that was a new entrance. What's special with that? So uh, it's a New Jersey transit entrance on the corner of 7th Avenue and 31st uh, and it was uh, one of the newest entrances into the facility. It was done in about 2005 and it's an homage to the old station. A lot of people don't recognize that but it's got a glass canopy ceiling uh, mosaics all up and down the escalators yeah. uh, that call attention to the old station and it's uh, the whole thing is an homage to the old station as I like to say to my tours it's the most humane way in and out of Penn Station because <laughs> there's light it's airy it's the only place you don't feel like you're crawling into uh, a hole underground like yeah. most people do so what you're saying is that there are some remnants uh, from the old station still here today, and we're going to look at, at some of those, right? Yeah, so I've picked uh, three of my favorites. There are a bunch, uh, mainly because when they sort of took Penn Station off the map and put Madison Square Garden on top of it, the basement levels could not change because they couldn't disrupt train service to make those uh, demolitions and renovations. So everything that's under our feet, and we are on the uh, Amtrak concourse right now, uh, is all remnant of the old Penn Station. Hmm. And so uh, they've re-walled it up, kind of, uh, but everything under that, including the floor we're standing on right now, by the way, is old Penn Station. So uh, for your listeners, we're standing on a gray-blue terrazzo floor, which is uh, very institutional-looking, what we would come to expect from sort of the late 80s, early 90s, yeah. which is when this was refit. But under our feet is a 1910 cement poured glass block floor which used to let light in from the giant glass ceiling that used to be above our heads where Madison Square Garden is so light used to shine down from that ceiling to this floor through to the lower levels oh. and I'm actually going to show you the underside of oh. this floor in a few minutes that's one of my favorite remnants of the whole entire tour now what's important about these stairs are it's an original set of 1910 old Penn Station stairs. Hmm. Now the concourse was designed, the original concourse had two levels to it. Okay. From the top level where we are standing right now, this was the departure concourse. So if you were leaving New York through Penn Station up until 1963, you would move from this level and go down a long set of these 1910 stairs mm. directly down to track level. Mm. If you were arriving into New York, you would go through a shorter set of stairs to the level below us, which is now LIRR. 
So all of the old staircases, I thought for many years, were ripped up during the demolition. Yeah. And then one day after a tour a couple of years ago, uh, this haagen dazs next to us used to be an Auntie Anne's. I came for an Auntie Anne's pretzel, and I looked at these double doors, and I said, oh, I thought this was an office. <laughs> it's the entrance of track 17. And then I opened the door, and I realized I was standing at the top of the last departure level 1910 set of stairs. Wow. And uh, it's they're absolutely stunning to look at because they've gone through a lot of history. Um, there's, they're dented, they're pitted, but they are the original Penn Station really uh, preserved in front of us. That's incredible. So for the people who are listening and wants to come here, it's track 17. Track 17, right off of the Amtrak concourse next to haagen -Dazs. Perfect. Yes. So what's interesting about the original Penn Station was it was a technological marvel and an engineering marvel at the time that it was built in the early 20th century, but it was also a gorgeous homage to the baths of Caracalla in Rome, uh, the Brandenburg Gates in Berlin. Then the train shed, which was back where we were, the concourse area, was this very modern early 20th century uh, bit of marvelous engineering that was again designed very efficiently to get traffic in and out by having dual concourses. So this staircase is really uh, a manifestation of that idea of Beaux-Arts classical um, and modern early 20th century wrapped up into one. So it really sort of sums up Penn very well. As does the floor that I mentioned before that we're standing on, that glass block floor. Um, very, very useful, but also very beautiful at the same time to light the station. So this station came about because uh, people needed to go come from New Jersey to Manhattan, so they built a tunnel. Yeah. And then this was constructed, started in 1901 or something correct. like that, and it was finished by 1910, Ten. correct? The Pennsylvania Railroad was the one of the biggest companies in America at the time. As a matter of fact, it was the first company in America to reach the billion dollar profit mark um, because it controlled track from the Mississippi to the East Coast all over, but then also had connections out to the West Coast. So it was a very successful business enterprise. And their biggest problem was they couldn't get their riders directly into New York City. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the rights, so they had to drop them off in Jersey City yeah. and then uh, get them onto ferries to cross over from Jersey City to Manhattan. Yeah. And of course, that was a pain. So the president at the time, his name was Alexander Cassatt, he wanted to get his riders through, so he had to uh, build this gorgeous station. He had to get the rights to cross over the Hudson, mm -hmm. but they realized because of all the ferry traffic, they could not, so they dug under the Hudson. Mm -hmm. And that within itself was an engineering feat at the time, mm -hmm. uh, because you have to realize the tunnel that runs from New Jersey to here also goes straight through under the island out to Long Island. Yeah. That's why LIRR, the Long Island Railroad, is below our feet here I see. as well. The one tunnel that everyone's concerned about is the tunnel to New Jersey, mm -hmm. because it's really most of the country's lifeline to the south of us, yeah. to New York. It's the North River Tunnel, and um, the Gateway Project was supposed to be helping to alleviate that worry, because it's, it's over 116 years old, that tunnel. Mm. And if one thing goes wrong with it, it's only two tracks. Yeah. Not a good scene. <laughs> so um, they're hoping that eventually Gateway will uh, get the proper funding that it needs to be finished so that there are alternates yeah. or alternative methods to get from Penn to New Jersey and out down to Washington. And so I guess the people who listen to this, they were wondering, OK, so you have Penn Station and you have Grand Central terminal. Yes. So how do they relate to one another? Why can't you go from the one to the next uh, underground or something? Well, they don't really relate to one another initially because uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad that owned Penn Station and the New York Central Railroad which owned Grand Central were bitter rivals uh, until the end of their existence when they tried to join forces in the 70s when all train companies were going bankrupt. And, and why was that? Why did they go bankrupt? They went bankrupt because people were flying. It was easier, cheaper to fly, or you get in your own car now and drive down the interstate highway system. Really, the interstate highway system in the 50s was the death knell for uh, regional and national train travel. I see. Because you buy your car and you can drive down these highways to any state you want anywhere in America. Yeah. Um, but then planes didn't make it any easier. As you're getting into the 60s and 70s and plane travel is becoming more in vogue, it's becoming cheaper, uh, you're definitely not taking a train to New Orleans say, or yeah. to L.A., yeah. you're going to fly. Yeah. You know, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. What I was going to say is, in 2022, 
uh, Pennsylvania Station and Grand Central Terminal will be connected for the first time in either of their existences. Um, the MTA is working on East Side Access, which is utilizing a connection uh, and creating a connection from here to Grand Central Terminal so that LIRR passengers for the first time ever can have access to Grand Central Terminal. And they're working on it as we speak. Wow. Yeah. And this is like 110 years later. Uh, even more so. Because <laughs> the LIRR has been in existence since the late 1860s. Oh. So this is, when I do my Grand Central tour and I bring them into the Biltmore Room where the uh, escalators will be, yeah. where they're building them to go down to the LIRR platforms, yeah. they get misty-eyed. They get to, they're like, are you kidding me? This changes our lives. That kind of access to Grand Central Central will save 45 minutes for the typical Penn Long Island commuter if they're coming in to New York from here and they need to go east that's a real slog from here we're gonna turn the corner here and if you look up here's your original 1910 glass block floor oh yeah that used to again the terrazzo that we were standing on upstairs yeah was it didn't exist. And the light would come from, from upstairs, from the glass ceiling, from the sky, down through here, and then you see the, this terrazzo patch right here. That was glass block floor too. Oh. So daylight went all the way from the sky to track level. That's an incredible idea. An incredible idea mainly because it cut down on your electric bills, so uh -huh. you didn't have to, because this place was triple the size of Grand Central Terminal, the original Penn Station. You could fit three Grand Centrals in this building. Wow, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, and you didn't want to pay for electric all day, yeah. so use the natural light. And of course, natural light just feels better, it looks better. Yeah. And that's what they did. So this is one of my favorite remnants because, hey, uh, people don't really look up here because it's all of the, um, the services and uh, utilities are running for the current station here. Yeah. And nobody realizes that if they walk to the bottom of track 13 and look up, that there's a glass block floor right there. Also, the underside of. So you realize so it goes right from the sun straight down to the track. Straight down, oh, straight down to the track. Yeah, because that, that would have, that's glass block too. Oh well, yeah, 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 I understand. So there's two floors down, yeah. basically, yep. with natural light. Yes. And that is something, uh, you know, every architect would dream of today. And, I mean, totally, <laughs> right? You know, this was, this was 100, 110 years ago or something like that. Now, it's, it's with, with mixed feelings you walk around here because you get the sense of what it was yes. like. Yes. And this is uh, horrible. <laughs> I mean, no, it is. It's, aesthetically, it's, 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 it's not a beautifully designed transit hub. And the reason why was this was in the 1960s at both a demolition site, yeah. a construction site, and an active transportation hub processing about 600,000 people, 550 to 600,000 people a day. Mm -hmm. And for three and a half years, they could not disturb one day of transit uh -huh. for both demolition or construction. So you basically had to make all the pieces work where they were yeah. and sort of jam them into place, which is why Penn Station's the worst user experience in the world, probably, yeah. because of that, that issue. I see. And we still live with it today. So they couldn't start with a clean slate? No clean slate, no. And it's great for historians and people like me who love remnants, but it's a nightmare for people who are commuting yeah. <laughs> and are trying to find their way. Whereas Grand Central is just a dream. Yeah. You know, it's just a lovely place to, it is to a, commute. It is a wonderful place. Yeah. We are right at the entrance to the southbound one train. If you go directly across and look through the window, behind this window, are Penn Station's Whisper Gallery. So uh, Rafael Guastavino, a Catalan architect who came to America and did these vaulted terracotta uh, vaults and ceilings, and they were beautiful. They took New York by storm. Most famously, we can find them City Hall Station, abandoned under City Hall. Yeah. Um, and of course, the most famous is uh, the entrance to the Oyster Bar Grand Central Terminal, which we call the Whisper Galleries, yeah. because you can stand in each corner talk quietly to one another in each of the corners and uh, tra sound travels over the ceiling. Now here, people don't realize because this is an abandoned corridor, Penn Station has their own whisper galleries right here. So 
now we've left uh, the Penn Station and we're on 8th Avenue and in front of us we have this uh, building. This looks like uh, a train station should look like. Ah, right? and it, it will be a train station. So this is actually at the moment and has been since 1913 a post office and it's been the main post office for New York City. Uh, since it opened, it's actually designed by McKim, Mead & White, the same architects who built the old Penn Station. Yeah. It was designed as a sister building to Penn Station. Uh, and what we are looking at across 8th Avenue is one of the longest continuous colonnades in North America. And it is an absolutely uh, gorgeous Beaux-Arts structure, which uh, in January, which for us is a couple of weeks away, is supposed to be uh, the grand opening of Moynihan Train Hall, which nestled in a courtyard behind this front entrance that we're looking at, will be 175,000 square feet of new concourse wow. for LIRR and mainly Amtrak riders. And the idea was it was a Governor Cuomo initiative to improve the conditions at Penn and to create a uh, better gateway for New Yorkers. I think it looks very stylish, and it has a very nice uh, quote on it, too, on the, on the facade. Yes. So what does it say? So it says, uh, Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. And a lot of your listeners will probably uh, recognize that, oh, that's the uh, motto of the U.S. Postal Service. Yeah. Uh, it absolutely is not. It is from the ancient Greek writer Herodotus, uh, <laughs> and this is from uh, 500 B.C., and he was actually writing about the Persian army's courier system from the battles of 800 BC. And uh, because it's a Beaux-Arts structure, part of Beaux-Arts was heavy classical illusion. So McKim, Mead, and White thought it best to put quotes and also homages, what other people don't realize are, uh, there's Cardinal Richelieu's name is up there, because yeah. Cardinal Richelieu had a very fine postal service in France at the time of his reign. Uh -huh. So all of this are uh, homages to great postal services that worked. Now, of course, when this building opened, uh, the U.S. Postal Service said, ah, that's a pretty neat motto. Uh, we should adopt that for our own. And of course they did. And I believe the most current iteration is neither snow nor rain. That's it. That's all they use now as part of their motto. But uh, there it is given to them by McKim, Mead and White here at this uh, post office. But you said something before that when you left, when you when you exited the Penn ah, Station. Yes. <laughs> so actually this is probably the most favorite quote to be associated with Penn Station. And it's by uh, architectural historian Vincent Scully. He said, uh, with Penn Station, we used to enter the city like a god and now we scuttle in like rats uh, and I said that to you as we were literally scuttling downstairs under yeah. the 7th Avenue entrance to get into Penn uh, and it feels like that every time um, what a lot of people don't realize is there's going to be a lot of new office space and retail and restaurant space yeah. eventually I guess post pandemic and uh, Facebook is a very big tenant here they bought up most of the office space uh, so they are having a lot of faith in the world returning back to uh, offices here at Moynihan. The name of the building will stay the same, or will it be the Moynihan Train Hall? Uh, so, uh, very good question, because there are two names that this building has associated with it. The Farley Post Office, uh, and James Farley was the man who brought the Postal Service out of debt during World War II by creating airmail. So they initially named this building the James uh, Farley Post Office. Uh, it will be called Moynihan Station after uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was a state senator who lobbied very hard for the improvement of Penn Station from the early 90s. He was yeah. pushing for funding to do this. And uh, the reason why was he was a shoeshine boy in the old Penn Station. And he loved the old Penn Station. So he wanted to uh, recreate that grandeur by using a McKim, and White building to create a new train hall across oh, the see. street. That's very appropriate. Very appropriate. How did you uh, end up with Untapped New York? What, what, is, what is your story? <laughs> Actually, it relates to this building. Oh, um, is that right? Well, Penn. Um, so I had uh, written a show about the, the demolition of the old Penn Station, which uh, played on Off-Broadway yeah. back in 2015. And as part of a guerrilla marketing tactic, I was a reader of Untapped, uh, an admirer. It was called Untapped Cities then. And um, I reached out to Michelle Young, the founder, and said, hey, I'm doing this show about Penn. Do you want to partner up? 
And I figured she wouldn't even write me back. She'd probably think I was a kook. She said, oh my God, I love the old pen. Let's do it. So I was actually doing the tour to sell seats to the show. I see. And then Untap New York uh, was starting their experience department. And they said, hey, do you have any other tours or any ideas? We want it. Your pen tour has been a bestseller. Yeah. Um, do you want to do anything else? And I said, I got a ton of ideas. And uh, that was the beginning. And from there, that was, you know, almost five and a half years ago. Uh, we built an experience department with, uh, we had 20 guides on staff. Uh, I don't even remember how many experiences. I've created uh, 12 experiences myself, yeah. including the subway tour that you were on. Yeah. So that's how I got started. It was all because of Penn. So I, I'm, always, I'm very thankful for Penn Station, actually. <laughs> so you are a writer, a playwriter, yes. educator, tour guide. Yes. So how do you fit in all those different things into your personality? What is the, what is the common thread? Uh, the common thread is, I think it's, I think it's teaching. Actually, I, I like to tell people things yeah. and give them information um, because I have always felt, ever since I was even a little kid, I've always asked why. I've always been a uh, an answer seeker. Yeah. And I always felt that there's a lot of value in giving people knowledge. Yeah. And then working with Untap New York, I found that it's also a lot of fun to show people things that they don't know are even hidden in plain sight. And so, for example, what we're doing today, none of this is behind a locked door or a wall you can't get to. It's all out in public, Yeah. but nobody knows it's there. Yeah, yeah. They walk by it, and I love being the guy who shows you that. Yeah. Because then you've got that knowledge. And like you were on my subway tour, and you said, you know, there are things about the subway tour uh, you you don't forget because it's not because of me it's because the stuff is there it speaks for itself I'm just the guy who shows it to you yeah and so I love doing that and I feel like my writing has always had an element of uh, telling a story that gives information so how can people support untapped uh, New York uh, we have an insiders membership group uh, which has now become a global membership group. Uh, we're doing virtual experiences. So that will include, uh, you know, we're doing virtual talks about the very stuff we're talking about. Yeah. Um, live stream tours from certain locations. And the idea is that we are going to be bringing New York to people, even if they're home in their living rooms. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. I'm now in charge of that initiative now that the in-person tours have quieted down for the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but once we're back up and running, coming on a tour is a great way also to support us. Uh, if you're coming to New York from somewhere else, look us up. Or if you're a New Yorker in the New York area, uh, jump on one of our tours. I just came from this morning before I met you, a Grand Central tour that I gave to all Manhattanites. Yeah. They would just want to get out. And they absolutely loved it because they're like, well, we've walked in Grand Central, but we didn't know anything about it. Our mission is to help New Yorkers rediscover their city. Yeah. New York is the most history dense area of the new world. I mean, it's, it's, it has 400 years of history, whereas even what we as Americans associate as our history, like in Virginia or uh, in some of the first settlements up in Plymouth or Boston, not even close. Like, yeah. you know, the Dutch got here in the 16 teens yeah. uh, and then built a world class city in the 1660s here. So um, we have all of that knowledge and all of that history to sort of sift through here in New York, even today. Yeah. So now now we are in the car. We have left uh, Penn Station and the Moynihan train hall and heading towards um, City Hall. Uh, we were discussing here earlier uh, the Hudson Yards. Are you doing uh, Hudson Yards tours? Yeah, so uh, Untap New York uh, does uh, Hudson Yards. We do a brief architectural walkthrough tour on the platform around the buildings, and then we uh, drop guests off to go up to the edge platform, yeah. which is the uh, tallest uh, man-made observation deck in the Western Hemisphere. I think the thing about Hudson Yards is it's sort of admirable from an engineering standpoint, but architecturally it leaves people kind of wanting more. I guess it lacks a human scale to it or, or any kind of like humanity to it. It's more just a created experience that seems to center a lot around retail and dining and you know, high-end products. Yeah. Uh, and I was mentioning to you that I actually was uh, at a talk that one of the uh, vice presidents of the development company in charge of Hudson Yards was giving to the National Art Club. And he said, well, you know, we're really sort of developing this for the 1%. He just he came out and said it. 
Yeah. And uh, I don't think he realized his audience very well because I think he thought he was speaking to a more affluent audience. But the National Art Club is a very um, diverse uh, club of old artists who came to New York in the 60s and 70s to become artists and then of course probably came into a little money but had that sort of in their blood and they, they just railed on him they said how dare you say that uh, and of course what Hudson Yards is going to link up to is the back of Moynihan and what I find interesting is is that you know the Hudson Yards has I forgot 175,000 or 178,000 square feet of retail uh, and dining, and then you're going to have more retail and dining in Moynihan. And yeah. my question is, who who's going to go to all of these yeah. places? Like, how are these people going to make money when they're all fighting? You know, how many Banana Republics do you need yeah. in a two block radius when a lot of people have moved from brick and mortar shopping to online shopping? You know, it it seems like it's almost tone deaf. Yeah. Um, but. That's the way you pay for these things. You pay for these transportation projects. You pay for these development projects by putting in high-end retail because they can pay the rent, basically. Yeah. We've uh, turned down Chamber Street in the cab, and we're not too far away from the Oculus, which was one of the most expensive uh, New York uh, projects for transit, uh, that, which opened in 2017, and it's the PATH station down at the World Trade Center. And it was designed by Santiago Calatrava, and it cost $4 billion. And it was originally supposed to cost $2 billion. And it, it went over budget, it went over time, it was, you know, I forgot, seven years late. And uh, when it opened, New Yorkers were furious because they said, you know, who cares? And, you know, $4 billion, and it only services a couple hundred thousand people. Not even, technically, like 45,000 people a day, whereas where we just came from in Penn, 600,000 people have to deal with the morass of Penn Station. Yeah. And what the Oculus is, is it's a mall. You know, they put in all this high-end uh, retail in there to make the money for the space. And you had said, well, you know, if you build it, they'll come. That's what you've heard. I don't see anybody. It's been open for almost four years. There's nobody ever in any of those shops, with the exception of Apple. Yeah. There's an Apple store in there, and everybody's always an Apple, but they're doing it to, like, charge their phones and, you know, see Apple products. So I, I don't know. I would be interested to see what the success of the Oculus is as a retail center yeah. because there was a lot of ire that was drawn when that opened by a lot of New Yorkers. Yeah. I, I think it's a fascinating building in, 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 in many ways. And it's a, when you, I remember when I first went in there, it almost uh, took your breath away. Mm, I totally. mean, the scale of it is like a cathedral. Yeah. It's an incredible. And maybe that's why they, they built it. They wanted to make a statement, right? They wanted to, to create something that would be uh, impressive. But on the other hand, it is sort of a little clinical. It's all very white. It's very white. So now we have moved to down to City Hall. City Hall Park. And we're standing here uh, right by a fountain. The Jacob Rymould Fountain, actually, which actually used to be uh, up further north, closer to City Hall Park, which they moved because from post office to post office, uh, this used to be a post office. This was New York's main post office on the site that we're standing in before they opened the post office that we were talking about uptown. The reason why we are here is because probably one of the most coveted spots in the New York City transit system is Old City Hall Station. And Old City Hall Station was shut down to rider uh, usage in 1945 because it was deemed to be impractical. Uh -huh. It was a very small platform. It only went uptown. It did not have downtown access. Um, and they found that most of the riders at the time were going to Brooklyn Bridge City Hall uh, subway station right on the other side of the building. So they shut it down, never to be used for the public again in 1945. And of course, it's probably the most beautiful train station in New York City. Remember Rafael Guastavino? Yes. Well, Rafael Guastavino designed that station. It was... Uh, on a curve, 14 support arches and 14 vaulted uh, ceiling areas, much like Oyster Bar at Grand Central. Beautiful, beautiful ornamental terracotta tile, <laughs> like nothing you see in any of the other 470 some odd stations here in New York. And of course, you can't get into it. 
<laughs> but there is one way most savvy New Yorkers know, and you and I are going to do that trick in a little bit. You take the 6 train where it terminates right under City Hall, and you go through the loop as it turns itself around to make it an uptown train. Yeah. So that's the little secret that New Yorkers don't, uh, not all New Yorkers know, some New Yorkers know it. But why we're here is I wanted to show you something. I don't know if you want to move mm -hmm. this way, but uh, in the north uh, corner of the park closest to Broadway, you can actually see a little remnant of the station itself sticking up in the grass where we have all these squirrels and pigeons usually <laughs> flying around. But if you go to this set of benches right here, you're gonna see a concrete platform right there. And that concrete platform in the middle of the trees and in the grass, that has glass block in it. And that glass block, much like it did in Penn, brings the light down to City Hall Station. And there are three of these portals. This one is the first. The other one is over here, um, beyond these chess tables here where you see there are uh, red or orange cones there. That's portal number two. And then portal number three is in front of that security kiosk in front of City Hall. Hmm. And you see they're in this sort of crescent moon turn here. Yeah. And that's the whole of City Hall Station. It's a very small station. Huh. But it's right under our feet. It's right under street grade. And uh, light, again, natural light played a very big role in being used in the original subway system, which was started by the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, or the IRT. So this loop loops around, goes through City Hall, and then makes itself the uptown train. So why hasn't uh, anybody come up with the idea of opening up this space? Because it's pretty uh, extravagant. It's very extravagant. It's very popular. The New York Transit Museum gives tours uh, four or five, maybe six times a year to their members by bringing them in via six train and uh, leaving them out there for about a half hour. Hmm. Um, I have proposed myself to the Transit Museum when I was doing some work for them. I said, hey, why don't you make it a museum? Yeah. Charge entry at street level, 10 bucks, Give everybody 15, 20 minutes to look around and get them out. And be a you know, a big money maker. And they say no, there are safety issues. You know, that's a it's an active track platform. I said, well, so is every other subway platform that you let the public <laughs> down on. Yeah. Uh, and we do okay. Uh, but the entrance to City Hall, it's tough to see. But behind those parked cars, there's a temporary fence, and that's the, the there's a gate right there. That's the entrance down. It's one staircase down into the uh, station. Wow. It'd be easy to access. It would be easy to open up, put a security guard there, have a booth, and pay some money. We're going to see the secret station. Yes. This was station number one. This was the first ceremonial opening station of the entire system, uh, City Hall. So this is, again, for so many reasons, people just want to get into City Hall, and they can't. So everybody's going to be getting off this train. We're going to be getting on this train. We're the only ones on this train because it's terminated. It's going from downtown to uptown. In about 50 seconds after the train clears the station, we are going to go through City Hall. I see. Again, the coveted station that everybody wants to see. And the nice thing about City Hall usually is that the lights are on, so you can see right up the staircase to the mezzanine. You're going to see that decorative tile from Rafael Guastavino. He used whites and greens and beiges. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to see naked incandescent light bulbs because they wanted to show off electricity in 1904. Yeah. Much like they do the same thing at Grand Central for those uh, uh, chandeliers because, again, showing off electricity and electric power was a big deal back in the early 20th century. Yeah. So you'll see those on as well. What we'll miss, because they're above our heads, are the, the chandeliers. But as we pass through, you're going to see ambient daylight coming through because of those uh, portals that I showed you yeah, in the park before. In the park, yeah, yeah. So you told me an interesting story about this guy, uh, the speaker in the subway system, who yeah. is so familiar to all of us. Yes, yeah, so everybody in New York, I'm sure, has had an experience with stand clear of the closing doors, please. Ding dong and they close the doors. <laughs> uh, so that is a recorded voice, but it's not a digital voice. It's actually a real person. Uh -huh. and his name is Charlie Pellet. And uh, one of our tour guides, Mandy, was giving our tour and doing this very thing we are, which is going through the City Hall loop. And she hears a man speaking behind her. 
and she says, God, that's the, that's the subway guy. So she gets a video with him as they're looking out the windows, and he goes, yes, it's true. This is Charlie Pellet, and I'm the sand clear of the closing doors guy. <laughs> uh, and he says, but Mandy, you do it much better than me. So Mandy does it, and everybody laughs, and it's a really great story. It's one of my favorite New York stories yet. So here we are. We're in the tunnel now. As I'm sure your listeners can hear the screeching. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're making the, the loop turn, and in a couple of seconds, out this window, we're going to see City Hall. It goes by very quickly because it's a very small station. It's not very large. There it is. Oh, here it is. So wow. you can see the tile. Beautiful. See the light? Yeah, I saw the light there. And there are the naked light bulbs. There's only one working today. Beautiful. So now we actually stopped at the City Hall's uh, station Yeah, so we're, we're actually stopped in the loop because there's a six train ahead of us uh -huh. that's probably waiting, we're waiting for him to pull out of the uh, northbound station. Huh. Once we complete that loop, what we'll find is when we get off the train, we're going to be just directly across where we started from, which is on the uptown side. I don't know if you remember from your tour, one of the things, one of my favorite things besides this was the ghost stations. Um, and the ghost stations were those uh, abandoned stations that were dark. And I ch uh, ch basically cast the flashlight out as we passed by Worth Street. Yeah, that's right. Um, because originally the IRT stations were only designed for five car train sets. Mm -hmm. And then of course to uh, compete with the new companies that were making larger, wider, longer train sets, they had to expand their train sets to 10. So they had to go along the original line and physically extend all of their stations another 200 feet. So when they did that in the mid-century, from about the late 1940s to the early 1960s, they found that some stations were way too close together and they just shut some of them down. Uh -huh. So there's a station between Brooklyn Bridge City Hall and Canal Street called Worth Street, which our tour went through, a uh, very long downtown platform, which is completely dark and abandoned, full mm -hmm. of graffiti, but it was built in 1904 and hadn't been used since 1961. Mm -hmm. There's also an abandoned station in 18th Street between Union Square and 23rd Street. I see. Also, that was shut down in 1948 huh. because Union Square went further north, 23rd went further south, and 18th Street just didn't seem useful. Is that why Spring Street has a sort of an old part of it and then a, a, a more modern yes. part of Yes, so it? the Spring Street side that I had showed you on the tour has that literal line in the wall between 1904 and like late 1950 where they built out the station in the extension. Talking about the uh, subway system in New York, so yes. um, maybe uh, as opposed to other big cities, there were three competing companies, Correct. right? So Yeah, they were in competition with one another for a while. So the first was the Interborough Rapid Transit Company. Yeah. They came online in 1904. They're the, for New Yorkers and people who know the New York subway, those are all of our number trains. I see. So the one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. That's the original lines. Uh, the second, company to come online, that was the Brooklyn Manhattan Trans Transit Company, and they came online in the 19-teens as a competitor to provide more service to uh, New Yorkers who wanted to use the subway. Those lines today in New York are the N, the Q, and the R, which are the yellow lines, and the J and the Z, which are the brown lines. Yeah. And then the third and final line to come on in the late 20s was the independent city-owned line. Uh, and that was the city started their own company in preparation for unifying the system, which they did in 1940. And those trains are the A, the C, and the E, the blue line, the B, the D, and the F, the orange line. And uh, we've interchanged a couple of lines now and then. But uh, those, that, those are the, um, the independents, or what was known as the IND. I and see. in 1940, the city bought them all up, unified the system, and then took it all over as a city agency. Hmm. Which it was until 1968 when it became the MTA, Metropolitan Transit Authority, which is a state agency. I see. Well, I learned from you when I did the subway tour that uh, they are actually different. These trains are different. They yes, have different sizes because of the proprietary uh, company. They wanted to make more money, so number trains are thinner. 
yeah. and hold less people than the letter trains, which are wider and longer to accommodate more people to make more money. Yeah. And uh, a lot of New Yorkers, when I give the tour, I said, you know, we're in a number train right now. Do you feel how different it is from a, a letter? And they go, oh yeah, I never thought about that. Completely different size subway car. Yeah, interesting. So down here at City Hall, I, I learned that this used to be the, what do you call, newspaper center yes. of New York. So this is uh, Park Row, and Park Row used to be known as uh, sort of newspaper row. And the building that we just walked by, which is now Pace University, was the headquarters of the New York Times until 1904. And actually the Times has a connection to the subway system. 1904 was the date that the IRT opened their first train down here. And the owner of the Times was friends with the owner of the uh, IRT. And he said, when you get to 42nd Street, don't name your subway station anything other than Times Square. Because originally they were just gonna call it 42nd. And uh, the rest is history. So the, the uh, subway system actually predates the Times moving up to Times Square by a couple of months. So the Times Square comes from New York Times? Yes. Huh. Before then it was known as Longacre Square, which is actually uh, named after the same area in London where all of the carriages used to congregate. And uh, Longacre Square in New York was also a place where carriages congregated. So that's very early transit. <laughs> <laughs> so we're standing in front of the... Um... The Manhattan Municipal Building. One of the things about this building is it's designed by McKim, Mead and White, who were the architects of the post office where we just were and the old Penn Station. Uh, as a matter of fact, they were working on this building as they were wrapping up uh, on the post office and they just had finished Penn. So there's a lot of the similar architectural illusions in this building that they used in both of the buildings uptown. This is an example. It's the first Beaux-Arts high-rise ever built because this building is very tall. And uh, this is the first building in the world to ever have a subway station built into its foundation, which is under our feet at the moment. Now, what a lot of people, most people don't realize is this building has a very elaborate colonnade in the front of it. This building was actually intended to be phase one of a larger gateway project known as the Manhattan Transportation Center. And through the archway, there's a great atrium way that leads nowhere today. <laughs> there was supposed to be a Grand Central-like terminal that was going to house regional train transit and national train transit. So this was gonna be the gateway into New York for the nation, pre-World War I. Huh. And then after World War I, um, resources were diverted, so it never got built. And then by the time everybody got back from the war, Penn Station, up in the 30s, Grand Central Terminal, uh, which opened as we know it in 1913, were bringing all people up to Midtown. Yeah. And downtown was less desirable then. It's an impressive uh, building and it's got a huge uh, tower. Huge tower and a very famous spire with a very famous sculpture on top of it, uh, which is done by Adolf Weinman, who was um, McKim Eden White sculptor of choice. He did all of the sculptures for Penn Station as well. The eagles and the clocks and all of the great things that used to be on Penn were done by this German sculptor. We are standing in, again, uh, a masterwork of Raphael Guastavino, which provides one of the most stunning entrances into the subway system that New York City's ever seen. And the problem is New York City never sees it because <laughs> ridership <laughs> is so abysmally low from this station. It's what we call uh, Chamber Street yeah. on the J and the Z. And nobody rides the J and the Z in Manhattan at all, nobody. So nobody ever uses this. And what you have here is almost like this enchanted forest of uh, pillars and vaulted ceilings that again are the masterwork of Raphael Guastavino, who was loved by McKim Mead and White. That's why he's, he's all over. But you do feel like a god when you when you come up here. There used to be a place on Park Row called J&R Music World where I would go to buy CDs and music after I was teaching. And I would take the J or the Z from Delancey Street, two stops, th three stops, to here. And I'd come up the stairs where these people are coming up the stairs and I went, what is this place? This place is, <laughs> for a Jay-Z station, this place is amazing. Yeah, it is. And it is, you, you feel like a god when you come out of the subway. But when you're down underneath, you realize it's like me and three other people have taken the train here today. <laughs> but this was a much busier transit hub. So we're now descending. What is the name of this um, subway station? Chamber Street. Interesting story, which I'm gonna tell you in a minute, is that this was supposed to be called another name entirely because of its location. But as we walk down the stairs, what you might realize when you look at this 
is that it's one of the highest and widest stations in the system. And there are five platforms here, which is again, very unusual for one subway station because this was a crown jewel terminal station for the BMT or the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Company when they opened it up in 1914. So the middle platforms that you and I are looking at have been abandoned since 1930. Nobody's been using them. Wow. They recently just built some elevators in here, which is why you're seeing a little bit of construction work going on. But uh, a lot of this has been abandoned since 1930, except for the two active platforms for the J and the Z. But it's, it's got a height and a length to it, which is very impressive. But if you go this way, something I love to point out on tours is all the way at the end of the track, looking out into the southbound tunnel, there's this remnant 1914 mosaic, really, really pretty mosaic of the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's this little sliver right here. Now, the reason why that mosaic is there is because this station was originally going to be called Brooklyn Bridge by the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Company. And here's the reason why. When you look down into this dark tunnel, you can see a shaft of light coming down from the ceiling. Yeah. That was the Brooklyn Bridge connection. That's actually the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh. So what they wanted to do was build a track right down into the dark here that would turn left and go over the bridge so that they'd have subway trains going over the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, I see. But in the last minute, they scrapped the whole plan because they said sort of the grade was a little too steep and the turn was a little too steep to get trains up there. But they put the mosaics in anyway. And that is a mosaic of the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, on my tour, I always quiz people. And of course, your listeners can't see it, but there's something missing from the Brooklyn Bridge on that mural that's very iconic to the Brooklyn Bridge. It's very subtle, though. Hmm. And I've been giving the tour for... Hmm, almost six years now, and I've only had nine people get it in all of those years. And I'll just tell you, it's uh, so one of the things that makes the Brooklyn Bridge so iconic is the crisscross suspender cables that give it that spider web look to it, oh, yeah. which are missing in this mosaic. There's only uh, the vertical suspender cables holding the roadway up. And the BMT executives, when they saw it, were livid because they said that could be any bridge anywhere in America. <laughs> but of course, did they spend the money to change it? No, they didn't. No. Um, but there's a little Statue of Liberty, too. Yeah, I can uh, see that. Too, right under right. there. Yeah. And so these mosaics used to run the entirety of the walls here, but there are only a few left, including this one. So this, this station has been renovated since then because you have all these uh, tiles. Yeah, so these tiles we're looking at are uh, put in in 1961. Mm -hmm. 1961, they closed off this uh, platform, and on the other side of the platform is Brooklyn Bridge City Hall for the 4, 5, and 6. So this used to be all open for a while. Justin, we just exited the Brooklyn Bridge subway station. And, yes. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time. It's been fascinating to go through... Penn Station, Moynihan Train Hall, and down in the subway system. Just get a glimpse of New York, uh, the remnants of New York. Yeah, my and, pleasure. And for everybody who's listening, untapped New York is where you should go to find New York, the old New York, the historic New York. And you should have Justin Rivers as your guide. Sure. Can I ask you a quick question? Which way to the one? the two towards downtown the one train yes so north. you've got to go west going. yeah so you're going to see chambers street yeah. you just want to walk chambers street until you hit about uh, yes. uh go about three or so avenues until you hit the the west side you'll see the one train down is, it, there. is it church or is it uh, yeah it's, right? it's church yeah, you'll see it it's right okay. off of chambers so that always happens in New York. Right? Always happens. <laughs> Even before I was a tour guide, people would always stop to ask me directions. Somebody said it must be, I must have a kind face. Yeah. So, everybody. So, yeah, so where, where, where was I before we got interrupted? Maybe I'll, I'll include that interruption. It's, always, <laughs> it's, it's always, a very New York it's moment. It's very New York. It very really New York is. moment. You're, you're doing your something and people come up to you. But that is the charm of this wonderful city. It really is. Uh, everybody's talking to everybody and uh, it's a good uh, sense of camaraderie here which you love. So. Justin, uh, once again, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. And uh, I look forward to the next yeah, episode. Yeah, definitely. We'll do, we'll There's do so much one. more to talk about. <laughs> we'll do another one yeah. soon. All right. From a cold New York, thank you so much for listening. And uh, talk soon. Bye-bye. This is Art Insiders New York. My name is Anders Holst. If you enjoyed this episode and have family and friends who love New York and are passionate about the world of art, design, and architecture in the city, please spread the word by following us on artinsidersnewyork.com 
or liking us on our Facebook page, Art Insiders New York, where we publish newsworthy material all the time. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. This episode was produced by UOM LLC, Copyright 2020.